Welcome, everyone. I'm Robert Giz, President and CEO of the Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association. Welcome to another installment of our 5G Canada What's Next series. I'm coming to you live today from our nation's capital. Normally, I'm coming to you from the birthplace of Confederation, but as things start to uh, open up, uh, I'm having the opportunity to get back on the road. As you all probably know, today was a big day in our capital with the swearing in of a new cabinet. Uh, for those who perhaps haven't been following along, um, we've got Jean or Francois Philippe Champagne, who stays at uh, ICED for us. We've got Pablo Rodriguez, who returns to Canadian heritage. We've got Goody Hutchings from uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, who becomes the new Minister of Rural uh, Economic Development. Probably three of the portfolios that the telecom industry would deal with uh, as uh, most closely. So uh, I congratulate all three, and uh, we're really looking forward. Uh, to working with all of you uh, and uh, the new federal liberal government so that we can help uh, deliver on all the benefits that are going to come uh, with 5G. It's going to take a lot of investment, as you'll hear from me in a moment, but um, we know that partnering with government is important, so I do want to congratulate uh, the entire cabinet. Bonjour à tout le monde et bienvenue à un autre événement virtuel sur la, le futur du 5G au Canada. Cette série nous donne l'occasion de regarder aux tendances et aux innovations dans des secteurs particuliers. This series gives us a chance to look at the potential impact of 5G in Canada, as well as how 5G will drive innovation in specific industry sectors. Past studies sponsored by CWTA have looked at the economic impacts that 5G will have in Canada, as well as the benefits that it will bring to cities and rural communities all across our nation. We have also looked at the impact that 5G will have on reducing Canada's carbon footprint. All of these reports can be found on our cwta.ca and 5gcc.ca websites. It's estimated that through the adoption of 5G, approximately 250,000 permanent full-time jobs will be added to the Canadian economy by 2026. It's also estimated that we'll see an incremental increase in our GDP by $40 billion by the year 2026 as well. Accenture also estimates that with the implementation of 5G, mobile technologies will have the potential to account for up to 23% of Canada's current emission reduction targets by the year 2025. These numbers illustrate the great benefits that 5G offers Canada. But realizing these benefits will require a tremendous level of investment by our wireless network operators. It's estimated that the initial rollout of 5G in Canada over the next five to six years will be approximately $26 billion, and that does not include spectrum fees. We have often illustrated how 5G will be a catalyst for economic growth in Canada and across many industry sectors. We're fortunate to have great speakers with us today to discuss 5G and Industry 4.0. We're pleased to have Jason Elliott, Head of Portfolio and Partnership Marketing at Nokia, and Samuel O'Halloran, Director of Strategy and part of the Global Strategy Consulting Team at PwC. I want to thank everyone for being here today. And now I'm very happy to turn it over to our Senior Vice President of the CWTA, Eric Smith, who will moderate today's panel. Thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, thanks for kicking things off for us. Um, thanks everyone uh, for joining us. I'm happy to be part of uh, our 5G Canada What's Next series again. And today I think we've got a really great topic for you. It's actually kind of a two for one special, Industry 4.0 and 5G. Um, and that's kind of how we're gonna treat them. We're gonna talk first a little bit about Industry 4.0 and then talk about the importance of 5G to realizing the full benefits of Industry 4.0. Uh, obviously, if you have questions, there is a function on uh, your screen. I think it's below the description of the event. There's a Q&A button. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to type them in and we will try to get uh, to as many as we can, uh, time permitting at the end. Uh, before we get into our discussion though, I, I'd like the panelists to introduce themselves a little bit. And so I'd like to just turn it over to Jason, just tell him a bit about himself and uh, his role at uh, Nokia. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's really great to be here. Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Elliott. So I head up the portfolio solutions and partner marketing at Nokia. 
I've been working on 5G for about the last five or six years now, actually communicating uh, the value of 5G, both to our service provider customers and also to enterprises at large as well. Um, and just a quick little bit about Nokia. So most of you might think of Nokia as making mobile phones. We sold that business uh, back in 2013. And now we licensed that brand. Our, our roots in Canada actually began in around 2000 with the acquisition of uh, Newbridge Networks. And now we're actually one of the largest uh, R&D companies in Canada. Um, and over the last 10 years, we've invested around two and a half billion Canadian dollars uh, overall. And we now employ around 2,400 people, mostly in research and development as well. Um, our products are, are widely used in te uh, Canada's telecom infrastructure today. We supply everything from 5G wireless communication systems to a fiber to the home, optical products, cloud, uh, cloud-based solutions, and also software solutions as well. And it's, it's quite likely, and in even the data transmissions we're using today on this webcast, uh, most of the data packets that actually travel in Canada will probably touch a Nokia product or solution at some point uh, in its transmission journey as well. So uh, we're, we're very, very excited to be here today in this call. Oh, thanks a lot, Jason. And yeah, I used to work just down the road from Nokia's uh, R&D headquarters here in Ottawa. And, uh, you know, definitely people, I think, know Nokia as a supplier to uh, Canadian telecom industry, but also it's a very important role it plays in R&D in Canada. Um, Sam, over to you. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Perfect. Thanks for that, Derek. Uh, and pleasure to be here uh, with you today. Uh, my name is Sam O'Halloran. I'm a director of the strategy and practice uh, within PwC. Uh, I focus primarily in the telecommunications industry uh, and work with all of the leading uh, sort of national and regional telecoms here in Canada. I've worked on 5G uh, and Industry 4.0 topics with them for many years now. 5G being their network and Industry 4.0 and the IoT applications and services around it being ways to monetize. Uh, and as that conversation has matured over the years uh, with the telecoms, I've also been uh, doing more and more work across the broader industry uh, as industrial sectors look to adopt a number of these technologies, uh, as well as the public sector as the government and regulators start to think through some of the topics surrounding it. So looking forward to talking about these topics with you and, and getting into the details. Great, thanks, Sam. And, and I, I really wanna commend the work that PwC is doing, um, especially over the past couple of years, they've done a lot of great work in telecommunications put a lot of great reports, white papers, et cetera. Um, earlier this year, just apropos to this topic, they put out a paper called uh, Collaboration is Key to Canada's 5G and Industry 4.0 Success. Um, they've also worked with us recently on a report uh, looking at the value that Canadians receive from their mobile wireless services. And uh, most recently worked with one of our members on a report looking at uh, both the cost of building networks in Canada versus other countries in the G20 uh, and versus the quality of services that, uh, that uh, carriers in various countries are able to uh, provide. And um, spoiler alert, Canada fares very well despite having sort of the highest uh, cost um, uh, structure in order of doing that. So if you uh, just simply type into Google PwC Canada Telecommunications, take you to their telecommunications page and you'll see all these great reports and I really encourage you uh, to do that. So on to the topic of, of today. So maybe Sam, I'll, I'll start with you. I'm sure when you're out with friends and family, one of the most often questions you're asked is, Sam, please tell us about Industry 4.0. Um, let's, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that. How would you describe Industry 4.0 for maybe some people who aren't uh, as uh, up to speed on the topic and want to learn more? Um, and maybe you could just tell us in your own words what you think of as Industry 4.0. Sure. Uh, not sure if any of my friends have asked me that question, but happy to answer it. Uh, look, Industry 4.0 for me uh, really represents the full integration of hardware, software, and connectivity. So hardware, think of sensors that are collecting uh, new sources of information across value chains or, or, or any number of processes taking that information and putting it into uh, a cloud sort of uh, data hosting or architectural um, uh, system. Uh, and then with the software around that, with machine learning or the ability to draw new insights, being able to run real-time information over that data. 
uh, and using the connectivity layer to ensure that that's pervasive and ubiquitous across all parts of a supply chain, not just in building, but through cellular uh, out in the field as well. Think remote monitoring, think fleet or autonomous vehicles. Uh, and the true integration in real time between that hardware, software and connectivity is enabling real time automation, uh, real time uh, efficiency and really reshaping the economy uh, and society. And I think it's important for us to recognize it's just not an economic benefit, but it has societal environmental benefits uh, as well. Okay, great, thanks. And, and Jason, maybe if you want to piggyback on that in terms of how do you view Industry 4.0? Yeah, I think it's um, really important to understand that this is really kind of like the first time that we're seeing this uh, bridging between the IT type systems and the operational technology systems that these physical industries uh, now use to create what we call uh, cyber physical systems. So we're, we're really starting to kind of, as Sam said, really uh, change the, the fundamental ways we automate processes now. It's uh, less about kind of um, manual processes and being able to do digital automation at a much greater scale, not just for um, simple processes and operations, but for a lot more larger complex and uh, operations as well, so that we can really uh, compete and scale and, and leverage um, the technology um, really from from every different type of uh, industry sector, not not just kind of the original sectors that benefited from industry 3.0, like um, you know finance or, or retail, but a lot of the physical industries like agriculture and mining, etc., as well. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think uh, you just touched on it there in terms of, you know, Industry 3.0, we obviously had, we're using, uh, you know, computer computers and using data, et cetera. Um, but based on how you describe it, I, I guess I would view Industry 4.0 as a tighter integration, both vertical and horizontal within organizations to really um, integrate all their different partners, both their internal sort of partners and departments, their external, you know, supply chain customers, et cetera, to provide um, you know, better product offerings, gather intelligence, um, make things more efficient, reduce costs and become uh, more efficient and productive. And, and with that, I mean, is Industry 4.0 just about saving costs? Is it just about increasing revenue or can we have both? Maybe Sam, I'll ask you. Uh, you can definitely uh, have both. Uh, and I, I just want to touch on your point there on Industry 3.0 uh, to Industry 4.0. I think, you know, we're really on the cusp of that now. I think of Industry 3.0 is sort of information sharing, if you think primarily what we do with computers and business today. Industry 4.0 is really the full automation through the sort of technical infrastructure we just spoke about. Uh, and we are seeing it getting adopted and, and to your question, driving uh, revenue through differentiation between companies. So although sometimes we see the benefits case or the technologies are not fully developed or fully mature, some early movers are adopting them and getting competitive advantage, gaining market share and driving revenue. Uh, on the cost side, we are seeing uh, increasing levels of automation uh, and waste reduction, which are reducing costs, primarily seeing that in larger enterprises now. Uh, but I think what's important is that layers down into the small, medium business market as well, which have the underlying cost structure, underlying supply chain that, that sort of feeds the productivity of the economy. And Jason, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think Sam touched on a point there as well. Is I mean, we, we definitely see uh, the adoption now for um, larger enterprises. And like I said, those physical industries are starting to come on board a little more. But it, but it is important as well that um, because of the technologies that we have now, including 5G, that, that they can, the smaller and medium sized businesses can actually take advantage of that. So this fourth industrial revolution is very, very important. It's not exclusive to those very, very large enterprises. I think it's really important to understand that um, we can use these technologies to actually apply to small and medium businesses as well. And, and so, you know, we've discussed a bit about what Industry 4.0 is at a high level, but how does it actually work? Like, are there any, are there, real world cases that you can provide in terms of how a, a business and organizations or even, you know, a public sector organization is using sort of the principles of Industry 4.0 um, to 
improve their operations, save money or gain revenue? And, and Jason, maybe I'll, I'll ask you. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, again, going back to kind of these very physical industries um, in terms of they, they think about uh, improvements in terms of safety, productivity and efficiency, and particularly in things like the mining industry, uh, we see autonomous vehicles and autonomous machinery being used to actually improve the safety in those very, very hazardous work environments. And uh, we're doing lots of trials in this area right now where we're automating uh, machines that can go into these hazardous locations, actually removing uh, the worker from the hazardous environment, allowing the worker to control those machines remotely. So that's from the safety angle. And um, also from, I mean, you think about supply chain, we were just talking about that earlier, um, ports, um, being able to increase the efficiency tracking inventory that's getting coming through um, the ships that are actually docking into the ports, understanding um, what location are in terms of logistics of what the different types of machines are within the port area, being able to track that, uh, control cranes remotely and automatic guided vehicles as well to actually improve the overall efficiency of the port. And then also stretching to things like agriculture as well. And this is very, very important. Um, as we look to be able to scale efficiently the production of our crops so we can use things like sensors from an IoT perspective actually uh, within the crop fields themselves to actually detect you know the condition of the soil uh, what the weather the temperature all those types of very very key metrics to really optimize crop yields as well over time so again lots of different ways that we can actually implement this technology across different types of industries. Oh, thanks. And I think a lot of people think of Industry 4.0 uh, um, as one of the key things is using data, data analytics, et cetera, to improve operations, efficiencies, et cetera. But Sam, are, are companies also looking at it as a way to uh, innovate and create new products, new services, uh, create sort of a stickier relationship with their customers? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, they're looking at, I mean, even we can look at the pandemic and, and how quickly trends are changing in terms of the adoption of digitized services uh, and remote services. Uh, we're seeing the use of Industry 4.0 technologies to support that and keep pace with those trends. Um, and we're actually seeing in the telecommunications sector where, you know, I spend a lot of my time, uh, a lot of the telecommunications companies investing heavily uh, into some of these technologies and use cases. Uh, we can look out west to tell us and what's happening in health, what's happening in agriculture. Uh, I'm really looking at that as ways to create new business models, uh, new revenue models, uh, and, and sometimes uh, really creating the ecosystem for R&D investment in the startup scene around it uh, within Canada. Yeah, and it, it's interesting that I was reading a study done, I think it was by McKinsey Group down in the States, and they're looking at the U.S., and you mentioned COVID. Um, uh, and, and they were looking at the impacts of, of COVID. Now, do you see that COVID, COVID has, uh, I guess, resulted in an acceleration of this digitization, the adoption of sort of the principles of Industry 4.0? Yeah, Either definitely. Way. So uh, there are trends that existed before COVID, I would say. I mean, we were already sort of on this train to further digitization, uh, but COVID's done nothing but speed it up. I mean... Uh, we've written about this recently in terms of shifts in remote services and preferences and, and, and sort of how rapidly that's changed. Population centers, uh, so people more remote working, moving out of cities and the implications of that um, for services. Localization of supply chains as governments, as industries are starting to understand that just in time supply chains creating problems as well as governments wanting more essential services uh, locally. Um, all of these trends are speeding up digitization, uh, investments in automation and, uh, and technology, uh, as well as the need for ubiquitous connectivity and high speed, low latency connectivity to support these use cases. Um, so for sure, I agree with uh, my peers down in the US who really uh, are pointing out quite correctly that COVID's done nothing but speed this up uh, and we need to make sure that we can keep pace and react to it. And we are seeing globally a number of governments uh, incentivize around Industry 4.0 as part of their post-COVID economic recovery plans. Um, and I think there's a lot of sense in that. And Jason, yeah, just, I mean, with the advent of COVID, have you guys seen a, a, a change, either a shift or an acceleration? 
We, we have, yes. And, and it's interesting to know, actually, um, again, when you look at industries uh, such as the um, finance industry, web, online and retail, you know, they, quite, they fared quite well during the, the, the pandemic because they had already adopted a lot of these practices to kind of automate processes and obviously go online so that e-commerce companies could continue to do business because they can access their customers. Um, what, what we saw was those physical industries, you know, transportation, energy, utilities, mining, food production, um, they were affected the greatest because they didn't have those capabilities there to be able to do uh, remote control of, of different products and services, and be able to kind of automate their production lines, understand what the supply chain was. So there was a greater impact for those uh, specific physical industries. And I think that's made everybody realize how important it is to actually kind of accelerate uh, their adoption of key technology, and kind of push through to kind of transform their business. So that that's that's very, very important. And, and we've definitely seen some acceleration in all different types of industries. Yeah, and, and the report I mentioned, I, I, one of the interesting takeaways from it that I saw is that pre-pandemic, uh, organizations that they dealt with were looking at digitization industry 4.0, et cetera, as mostly a way to save costs. But once the pandemic hit, much more of them were looking at it as an investment and a necessity really to stay competitive. And you know, the topic of this discussion, part of the, the title was the importance of industry 4.0 and 5G for Canada to stay competitive. So why, in your view, Sam, is Industry 4.0 important to Canada and Canada's competitiveness? And, and really, what are, you know, what are some of the advantages of being a first mover and what are some of the risks of not being aggressive enough in, in adoption? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So first of all, Industry 4.0, even though the name is sort of industry, um, you know, when we just touched on benefits before that were purely safety based, right? And it's going to reshape society more generally uh, with societal uh, sort of health as well as economic outcomes. Um, it will be important to keep pace with global peers on that. We work and live in a global trading order uh, where we are competing uh, for foreign direct investment or goods of trade. Um, jobs, obviously, competed for across uh, jurisdictions. And the um, competitiveness of, of our economy uh, will have huge economic uh, impacts, which will ladder down into community and individual outcomes around jobs and wealth creation, et cetera. Uh, we are seeing uh, a number of economies uh, move very quickly uh, into Industry 4.0 through what we're kind of coining uh, uh, the use of uh, investment catalyst uh, uh, policies. So governments being a little bit more active uh, and being directive in industrial policy or ensuring the adoption of these technologies, maybe since any time since the coming out of World War II in the 50s. And the reason for that is these technologies are becoming increasingly complex. Uh, the technology cycles are becoming uh, increasingly shorter uh, and some pair jurisdictions uh, are, are being very aggressive in, in driving the adoption of these technologies and economies are having to think through how can we incentivize and support our industries to adopt them. Um, Canada's a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say behind, Canada's in a reasonably um, good position, but needs to ensure that we keep pace with that. Because if we don't, it's going to be hard to maintain uh, the investment in jobs uh, and prosperity in Canada relative to trading partners. You only have to look at the states and some of the actions they're making around uh, this. We're in the USMCA, so uh, very uh, directly, uh, very directly impacts us, uh, as well as these wider societal and environmental benefits. Uh, the adoption of Industry 4.0 will be important for us meeting sustainable development goals, uh, etc. Yeah, and and I will get come back to you a little bit later on about some of maybe the policy prescriptions for for Canada. Um, obviously, the the other important part of this discussion is 5G, and I want to go over to Jason and you know really why is 5G important to realizing the benefits of Industry 4.0? Well. It it's interesting, if you think about the previous cellular generations, they were very um, predominantly focused on consumer services. So T, uh, 2G voice and text and 3G, some web and data, 4G mobile broadband video. And 
the initial uh, 5G specification was designed to kind of tackle uh, more of kind of like the enterprise focused types of services and use cases. Um, and there's, there's really kind of three key pillars to 5G. And, and right now we're only seeing the first pillar actually, which, which is really um, enhanced mobile broadband. So where you have higher capacity and higher data rates. But the, 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 the subsequent phases of 5G that we're seeing with these extra capabilities around um, low latency, which is the ability to control uh, machinery, physical machinery in real time, and what we call massive machine type communication is another key capability, which is really um, IoT, but on like a massive scale when we can connect not just hundreds of thousands or millions, but potentially billions of devices. Um, those are the key elements really in 5G that will be very different to what we've seen in 4G technology today. And when, when you think about it, it's not necessarily about comparing one technology to another. Um, with 5G, what we're able to do is take all of the existing services we have today, whether that be um, web, web and internet access, mobile broadband, video, add all those additional capabilities and be able to do all of this at massive scale. And that's the key point here is that this technology really is a game changer in enabling all these new types of use cases and services, particularly for the enterprise environment to drive industry 4.0 so we can control those, those physical environments, um, but also be able to do this at massive scale, something that we really wouldn't be able to do um, from a 4G infrastructure perspective. So that's that's a really big game changer. And it, it, it really is important to note that we're at the early stages of the 5G journey right now. It's really only just begun. And the subsequent phases that are coming in right now, just starting right now, this is really where we're going to see the acceleration uh, and of the capabilities of the technology and how that can really apply to Industry 4.0 and the associated technologies with that. Yeah, and, and I'm going to ask you to expand on one point there. You talked a bit about the limitations that we have now. Some cynics will say, well, we have, you know, we have fiber, uh, you know, to the factory. We have fiber to uh, whatever uh, buildings we're using. We've got Wi-Fi and its capabilities are, are increasing. And we've got 4G. So isn't that enough? Like, what does 5G really give you that we don't have today? Well, well, absolutely. I mean, I mean, in terms of fiber, that's great for actually providing broadband uh, access into a, a, a campus or a site location to be able to do that. Um, Wi-Fi, typically we think about that as, as being very relevant for uh, the back office systems. So, um, you know, when, you, when you're looking at kind of the, the planning systems and kind of like the IT systems, that's, that's fine. What we call uh, use in, in office or carpeted areas. Um, but really for operational technology, um, so if it's a factory floor, if it's a port, or if it's a mine or an energy grid, they really need much, much higher reliability and, and, and this lower latency or delay in the network to be able to do that at scale. And it's the reliability and also security that's very, very important to uh, these physical industries, these enterprises. And that's really where 5G comes into play. And as we start to see advances in um, battery technology for being able to be employed in, in large robotic systems, um, not having to connect a physical cable on the factory floor to these robotic systems means that um, they can start to move and replan like a factory industrial manufacturing environment. They could actually repurpose a manufacturing line in a matter of hours instead of days or weeks. So, so think of it again, like, you know, uh, going back to the pandemic, if you wanted to pivot from production of one specific consumer deliverable, but you then kind of wanted to uh, change the way the factory was configured so we could actually make other different types of assets. This wireless technology of 5G really has the capability to be able to do that, provide that flexibility, the scale, the capacity, and the security to kind of really drive those changes that the existing technologies today uh, can't really cope with. Yeah, and I think what you described as well, you know, fits perfectly from, from both your and Sam's earlier discussion of Industry 4.0 and the importance of data and using data to, to analyze things and action things. And so when you're talking about that factory floor, if you're, whether it's trying to discover what the inefficiencies are, or where defects are occurring or problems are, and then having to react quickly and reconfigure and do other things, um, that's really, I think I see where 5G comes in because it enables that 
collection and use of data from all these sensors and things like that. So it is, they, they definitely mesh well together. I don't know, Sam, if you had anything uh, to add on that in terms of the yeah. 5G component and the importance of it. Yeah, I think it's a very important topic. Uh, Industry 4.0 will be ubiquitous uh, across all levels and industries um, over time. Now, we're really just entering the, the, the cusp of it now, uh, and that will require ubiquitous connectivity uh, to ensure across supply chains and value chains or smart cities or whatever the use case, that the connectivity layer is there to support the integration of that hardware and software. Uh, yes, in building, you'll have technologies like Wi-Fi 6, which will be supportive, uh, but you will need that cellular connectivity uh, for the, the, sort of the, the, the non-accessible through, um, through in-building. Uh, and you will need it with this low latency. I think the low latency is really a, a killer application here of 5G uh, that was mentioned just before, as well as 5G's efficiency in connecting, uh, I think it's up to 10, over 10 times uh, more devices per square kilometer than 4G because we're going to have a huge amount of concentration of hardware and sensors within the economy. Uh, and I would also just say, um, you know, when we look at the 4G revolution and the movement into 4G, um, there is a lot of literature that points to the US getting a, a significant amount of benefit in their technology innovation ecosystem, uh, because their businesses were able to innovate uh, within the pervasive uh, 4G environment. And that's why you have Uber or Airbnb or, or sort of you name it within that environment springing up predominantly in the US where Europe and Japan sort of had more direct competition uh, and innovation ecosystem before that. I would say it's also important for us in Canada to make sure that we have this connectivity layer and this connectivity capability in our um, society or within the country to make sure that our startups and our companies are innovating within this technology uh, layer uh, that really represents the future uh, and that those technologies can be built here, scaled here and create prosperity here. That's great, thanks. And um, back to Jason, I just want to, you know, obviously uh, the CWTA, our organization, um, in addition to having great uh, equipment uh, suppliers such as uh, your company as members, we obviously have uh, the communication service providers as, as members. So what do you see as the, the CSP's role in industry 4.0? Are, are there opportunities for them just beyond providing connectivity? Absolutely. I, I think it's very, very important. And we, we touched on this earlier um, you know, we, we work with our service provider customers um, all over the world already, um, and we've already, you know, explored opportunities and, and driven opportunities with them uh, to address their enterprise customers as well uh, to be able to do that. Um, and it's not, it's not just large enterprises here. They, they have a unique position in the fact that, um, particularly for enterprises that are not specifically very large, where they have their own IT capabilities in-house, um, but, but small to medium uh, companies as well, uh, where the service provider can actually not just provide the connectivity, but provide the specific devices, the application, the hosting platform, uh, as well as the connectivity to really have a, a, a complete solution or package to solve a specific problem, where it be um, an inventory tracking system or the ability to collect data from machines on a, on the shop floor in a factory. And, and that, that point of simplification for that small to medium sized companies is very, very important and, and actually will help accelerate the adoption of that technology and actually remove the complexity for some of these companies. So that there is a very significant role here for service, service providers to play, I think, in this market. And, and, um, Sam, I mean, maybe the same question to you. I mean, you've obviously, you guys work with some service providers, not just in Canada, but around the world. And you're, I'm sure you're having these discussions as well. Um, what role do you see for the service providers in, in industry part auto beyond just connectivity? Yeah, well, I agree completely with Jason around uh, the solutions, uh, bringing it all together, simplifying it. Uh, the service providers will need to uh, play in these applications. You know, one thing we talk about in a number of our reports is the increased cost of 5G networks relative to 4G. Uh, the small cell nature, uh, et cetera, will really drive up uh, the costs and they will need to look for ways to monetize those assets. Um, 
The role that Jason described is a solution sort of integrator. Uh, we're already seeing that come to fore in, in a number of markets, including here in Canada, with a lot of success. A lot of the time that'll be through partnering with multinationals who have a lot of the hardware uh, and software capabilities uh, and are developing those or buying a lot of the startups uh, within that space. And we see that the CSP is really playing a role in services. So whether it's professional services and talking to uh, their clients to understand the benefits of these technologies, thinking through how to integrate them or, 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 or to, to enable the benefits, and then an ongoing managed service capability uh, to ensure that they're up and running and that they're always on time because these are very complex systems that will require very uh, specific expertise and the telcos with their large army of engineers and, and sort of uh, capabilities will be well positioned to do that as well as adjacent services around cyber security which is going to be a ginormous uh, topic uh, within the industry 4.0 uh, conversation and the aggregation of multiple systems into single dashboards and endpoints of reference and information to drive business decisions. So a, a number of monetization areas, uh, and it's really to, to Jason's point, integrating uh, and simplifying uh, very complex things uh, across the ecosystem of, of industries and companies that will adopt it. Yeah, and ju just, to, just to finalize that point there, um, what, one of the things is, is obviously you know, service providers are very used to selling to the consumer community and offering, you know, broadband plans. Uh, but really, from an enterprise perspective, it's a very different conversation, right? They, they, the enterprise is actually looking to solve a business problem. Like, I need to understand how well my equipment is operating. I need to understand where my inventory is tracked and my supply chain looks. So it's not so much, again, about selling that connectivity, that, that data plan. It's really about looking and talking with that enterprise and actually solving those business problems and having that conversation. Um, and that's something that, that we spend a lot of time at Nokia about is having that expertise to be able to help our service provider customers talk to those specific industries about solving those, those business challenges they have so that you can actually really generate a, a positive solution for, for that enterprise customer. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, it's always about what, what's the problem and what's the solution. And, and businesses obviously are very metric driven. They're looking for return on investment. Um, I know 5G is, you know, relatively new. Uh, but uh, are you seeing, you know, maybe uh, with Nokia, Jason, some of the things you're doing around the world, are you seeing the payoff quite quickly? Are people looking at this as, oh, gee, I have to make an investment and I'm not going to see an ROI for 10 years? or are they really seeing the benefits quite quickly? I mean, early days yet to get a lot of data there, but I think they are seeing the benefits and they, they will see those benefits over the longer term. Um, I mean, initially, it, it's really kind of like Sam was saying earlier, kind of making sure that the data is not siloed. So they're actually trying to create that level of visibility in their business to increase that operational efficiency. Um, and again, we're seeing a lot of adoption of the technology actually to um, improve safety, uh, quite frankly, because, because you know, obviously it's a, an imperative, actually is the, the biggest imperative is the safety of a company's workforce. So uh, in terms of investment and ROI, they absolutely can see the benefits in terms of not just uh, the operational efficiency of the business, but obviously in terms of um, the workforce and protecting the workforce overall as well. And we continue to do... Uh, many, many different types of trials across different types of industries to kind of really look at look at what the specific metrics are that they are tracking. It's very different actually across different types of industries and actually specific even within certain industries as well. So it's quite a complex operating environment, but um, we, we do see significant benefits across those industries over a period of time. Okay. Um, thanks for that. And earlier on, um, Sam, you were mentioning about uh, when we were talking about competitiveness in Canada, and I know PwC has done work looking at what other countries are doing uh, in terms of governments, uh, whether it's federal or state or you know, local. Um, what are some of the things that, you know, what's kind of your sort of key prescription, maybe, if you were to sit down with policymakers in Canada, either just pointing out what some other countries are doing or even more directly what you think Canada should be doing both in terms of uh, fostering adoption of, of newer technologies, the industry 4.0, and also really um, accelerating uh, the role of 5G. 
Sure. So I think it comes back to sort of that last question that, that you asked around the benefits case of 5G. Um, it seems reasonably clear with low band 5G, which is sort of what we, we, we have here in Canada at the moment. As we move into the mid band and high band spectrums, primarily a, a business focus or business application, you know, the, the benefits case is a little bit less clear. Um, and as such, you know, what we are seeing uh, is governments around the world, we say pair jurisdictions we've specifically looked at would be the G7 plus Australia and South Korea, uh, have made a number of uh, moves to try to incentivize and facilitate uh, the rollout of 5G networks and the development and adoption of industry 4.0 technologies. Uh, going back to my earlier point around the innovation ecosystem and competitiveness of economies, this is all well recognized. Um, and, and I would say, you know, you just have to look at the actions of these countries to, to, to sort of see that. Um, so in, to answer your question more specifically around 5G, uh, we've seen countries um, use spectrum policies um, to really incentivize 5G deployment. Uh, so this is either the timing of spectrum, so they made it uh, available early, uh, or they have introduced some incentives, whether it is for roll out over industrial uh, hubs or areas so not just you know incentivizing for areas not that not just urban centers as well as incentivizing for coverage across uh, core transportation corridors uh, and incentivizing for deployment across rural areas one for uh, manufacturing uh, or, or, or business out there but also looking at fixed wireless access to close the rural urban digital divide mm -hmm. Um, and we are on that point seeing more and more direct um, network incentives for deployment into rural and urban areas, whether they're tax credits or, or what have you. We actually have you know, a lot of activity here in Canada uh, with the Universal uh, Broadband Fund uh, in that regard. Uh, on the hardware and software front, uh, we're seeing uh, increasing uh, investment and organization around R&D um, pointed at specific uh, technology verticals of interest think AI, think quantum, uh, et cetera, and concerted government efforts on funding uh, and research uh, in those areas. We're doing a number of things here in Canada. You know, we have the Vector Institute, actually a leader in, in AI. Uh, and on the adoption side, uh, we are seeing governments pick uh, industries that are core or critical uh, to their economies uh, and really putting uh, direct investment into the adoption across those industries from industry 4.0 technologies, as well as trying to do more broad-based plans, uh, whether they're uh, learning, uh, whether they're um, test bed environments that replicate real world um, um, situations to, to, to show off uh, these technologies to the broad array of small medium enterprises uh, in the economy. Uh, and sort of finally, we are seeing public sector adoption where some governments are saying, hey, uh, the public sector is a large part of the economy, we can look to adopt these technologies ahead of the curve, uh, really drive demand and really drive pull on the SME or the, or the startup ecosystem around it within our own economies uh, and sort of develop that demand ahead of the curb as such. And finally, the last bucket I would say we're seeing a lot of activity on is workforce readiness. It's really a topic as I talk uh, with my clients and talk with uh, folks in the public sector that's sort of top of mind. Uh, the skills of the economy uh, to faci facilitate industry 4.0, uh, you know, it's a very big change in skills. Uh, and there's a lot of concerted efforts we're seeing to ensure that, you know, whether it's education um, at, within uh, tertiary or university, or even uh, uh, more sort of broad education targeted businesses, uh, looking to upskill the economy around a number of these technologies and their benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's a lot to unpack there. And I just wanted to, to drill down on a couple of things because I think, you know, there's the supply side and there's the demand side. And I think mm. that in Canada, we're, we're doing a decent job on, on the supply side in many respects. The demand side is, is obviously more difficult. And as we know, Canada has a bit of a reputation, Canadian, you know, private sector business being a little reluctant to be sort of the first movers or first adopters. You mentioned some countries where they're kind of, focusing on particular key sectors. And do you have examples of what type of incentives or things that they're using to help encourage the adoption of newer technologies? Well, I mean, they're looking one, so there's direct and indirect. 
So direct would be the use of tax incentives uh, for the adoption of technologies or investment R&D related to key government priorities. Uh, and indirect would be setting up, uh, you know, governance, um, as well as uh, sort of test beds and knowledge centers and information centers dedicated to these industry verticals uh, and the technologies within them and using those uh, to push or facilitate the adoption uh, across companies and the economy uh, within that. Um, so, and we're seeing, you know, some countries being a little bit more, to my point, directive um, with direct incentives and some being a little bit more indirect uh, through, uh, you know, designing mechanisms or um, opportunities in the economy, as I just mentioned. Yeah, and, and on uh, one of the things you touched on, I have a couple of audience questions I wanna to get to, and I, I've got one for you first, Sam, and then one for Jason. And you, you mentioned about working with the, the public sector and uh, workforce readiness. And one mm. of the questions that we've got is, you know, is, and I don't want you to call out specific gov governments you're working with, but, do you have you found is there sufficient level of sort of literacy on these topics digital literacy skills etc in the public service to be able to really innovate policies around the things we're talking around industry 4.0 um iot 5g those types of things um i i would i would think so and i think it's more around uh the design of the non-public sector so i mean uh, if you look at a lot of these institutes that are tasked with tackling these technologies or what have you, they're generally made up of a cross body of, you know, academia, industry and, and government folks uh, who have the requisite skills to make decisions. Uh, so if you were to take, I think I mentioned earlier, the Victor Institute uh, in Toronto, if you look at the board and the governance of that, even though it's funded uh, through government means, the governance structure is a very, very uh, incredible and, and very capable um, group of individuals that represents a cross section of, um, you know, the parties that need to be involved and understand this problem and understand sort of uh, what it will take to remain competitive in this space. And I think ensuring that we are designing for and sort of have those types of bodies uh, focused on this with a sort of a I don't want to say cross-functional, it's very businessy, but sort of a, a cross-stakeholder uh, governance structure. I think as long as we maintain that, that way of working, I think we'll be well positioned. Yeah, just, just to touch on something here as well. So what, what's really interesting we've seen um, in the transition to 5G actually is the, uh, the, the start of uh, specific industry trade associations like the 5G ACIA, the Alliance for Connected Industries, 5G Automotive Association. Um, again, you know, Nokia is both co-founders of those associations. But to Sam's point, they have a lot of different stakeholders in there. Um, and they're very helpful because they're helping um, really build like a, an ecosystem of, you know, the vendors like Nokia, um, the service providers, the industrial manufacturers, uh, the research organizations as well, and academic universities to kind of bring them together to really um, produce uh, the right frameworks and thinking about how 5G can be applied to, to the fourth industrial revolution overall. So a lot of those industry bodies are, are also serving a great role um, in, in bringing these different types of stakeholders together as well. Yeah. Thank you. yeah Canada has a, a strong tradition in innovation and R&D. Um, and as I do more work in the space, I'm constantly pleased and surprised that actually a lot of the strengths we have in here I think the question for me is pace, you know, uh, uh, are we go going about this as fast as some of the peer countries, I think is a secondary question. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and Jason, for you, another audience question, we're going to pivot from policy to more technical question. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier about when we were talking about the difference between 5G and, and sort of what we have today in terms of Wi-Fi and, and, and other connectivity. Um, uh, the question pertains to the difference between 5G and 4G. And can you expand a bit more about how 5G um, will improve security? So in terms of 5G, there are new uh, different types of uh, encryption technology, both for the radio air interface to be able to do this. And then there's also uh, an enhancement, which is a big difference from 4G, something called network slicing. 
uh, and this we'll see this come out in subsequent phases of 5G. And this is really kind of where we can create separate virtual networks with very specific operating parameters, um, including you know, the level of encryption or security, the different types of performances, and it actually isolates the different types of traffic um, across the network as well. So, so there are very different capabilities between 5G and 4G to support both from a security perspective and from a performance level perspective uh, compared to, to, to what we have in 4G today. And that, that's just two of the kind of bigger items, I think, overall. The, the, the other thing, obviously, I touched on earlier was, was the latency aspect. So while we can get to a very reasonable latency uh, to do a lot of different types of activities with 4G, for the very, um, very specific niche uh, industries in terms of industrial control of remote automotive equipment, uh, you really do need the very ultra low latency uh, type approach that, that only 5G can support and, and, the, and the reliability associated with that. And, and I think I touched on it earlier as well. Again, it's all about being able to scale this. So yes, you might do a comparison of one application or service between 4G and 5G, but the whole point is if you're running hundreds of different types of applications or you're connecting different types of robots with different types of machinery or you're doing transportation control systems and IoT control systems, can you do all of that at scale? And this is really kind of, I think, where 5G comes into play is, is that scalability aspect compared to 4G. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Well, we're pretty close to the end of our time. Before I turn things back over to Rob, though, I just wanted to maybe see if you had sort of one last thought you'd like to share with the audience, either to sort of encapsulate what we've talked about, what you think the important takeaways are, or if there's something maybe we didn't discuss that you wanted to mention. And Sam, maybe I'll ask you to, to just go first. Yeah, well, I think this is a very critical and important topic. Um, it really will define sort of the future economically, societally, environmentally for, for us here in Canada. And it may be a recurring theme in a lot of my answers, but I think speed will matter. Uh, I think having this environment and the underlying technology with 5G uh, to enable it, companies to uh, innovate, startups to innovate, uh, for us to work through the, the workforce requirements and everything, ahead of the curve of our global peers, uh, or even at pace of them, uh, will be critical to maintaining global competitiveness within a global trading order, and that will filter through to a, to a number of things. Uh, so, you know, for me, this is a, a very important topic, and to keep pace and to do that is going to take a lot of collaboration between all the parties involved, public sector, telecoms, industry, academia, working on shared goals, uh, and really bringing the best interests of Canada first, uh, and focusing on how we win this next race uh, for the next wave of the digital economy. That's a, that's a great summary. And Jason, over to you. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, that 5G deployments are just in their initial phases. We're at the start of this journey. Like I said, there's, there's a lot more capabilities that are getting start, just starting to get deployed and will be deployed over the next year to two years to support the fourth industrial revolution and all these new uh, technologies to really spur um, industry for our adoption overall. Uh, it's important from a collaboration perspective, an ecosystem perspective um, for, for companies like Nokia to, to, to work with service providers and other industrial partners overall to really specialize in those vertical industries so we can ensure uh, adoption and that we're creating solutions to really meet those needs is, is very, very important, I think. That's great. Well, again, I want to thank both of you very much. It's been a great discussion and I'm very uh, happy to be part of it. Uh, I'm now going to turn things over uh, to Rob again. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Eric, and thank you to uh, everyone who was able to tune in today. Uh, I especially want to thank Jason and Samuel. That was uh, insightful. Um, it was knowledgeable. It really demonstrates a lot of the things we talk about at CWTA, just about how we're in the infancy of 5G, the potential that 5G can have not only economically, but through innovation, through helping society, through climate change. Um, it's really about the future and the next industrial revolution, uh, as, as, as you said so clearly. So I thought it was a uh, great uh, presentation. I wanna thank you so much uh, for being involved. 
Uh, we're going to keep doing these, folks, um, until uh, we get back to the new normal or whatever the normal is is going to be. I, I'm looking forward to doing these in person again uh, here in Ottawa or around the country. Uh, but I can let you know that we're going to keep doing them virtually until we uh, think it's uh, uh, totally safe for us to get back together. So I'm happy to say uh, that we're going to have our next one um, on November 30th. Um, I hope uh, more details will be coming out shortly, but save that date. Um, and if you've missed any of our previous uh, events back in the spring, you can find them on our 5G website at 5gcc.ca and look for the 5G Canada What's Next button. Uh, you can also subscribe to our 5G Canada newsletter on that website by looking for the industry news tab. Again, uh, you know, 5G is an exciting time. We're lucky in Canada that we're a, a world leader. We've been called a, a 4G superpower. Um, and I think that that's going to be a catalyst to elevate us into being a 5G superpower at some point, uh, because we have uh, great companies in Canada uh, that are out there building uh, our networks to ensure uh, that Canada will be able to compete uh, on a worldwide economy. So thank you very much for everyone who attended today and for our panelists and for Eric for moderating. Uh, see you uh, November 30th.